And now, an eighth special presentation. This time on Artbeat Nation, an artist continues to push his limits. I'm always looking for adventure and growth. I want to grow as an artist. A painter who doesn't let his disability get in the way of his art. I don't find no disability about it. I just find it as a working career. Using modern technology to connect people with centuries-old artwork. What we're trying to do with this technology is put the visitor front and center. And a dance company puts Haitian heritage front and center. This other angle of hate and what we had to say about our country, about our culture, about our colors. It's all ahead on Art Beat Nation. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you. For decades, Floyd Tunson has created artwork that challenges viewers to look at the different sides of life, the beauty and the darkness, the chaos and the order. A recent exhibition in Colorado Springs puts 40 years worth of Tunson's ever-flowing work on display. I don't want to always be a narrative and I don't want to tell a story with a period on it. I'd rather have a story with a question mark. We believe that Floyd is one of the Rocky Mountain region's most significant contemporary artists. Never have I actually seen all this work the way I'm looking at it right now. And so for me, I actually had to think like, am I the artist, <laughs> you know, because when I see it, like I see, you know, in totality, it was overwhelming even for me, and I did the work. He finds the right media to draw us to the work and tease out some of those things that we might not have thought of before we walked in the room. So the work is not easy, and as I matured, I think I, I'm more caustic or I'm more provocative with what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to draw you in initially and then I, I try to give you a little punch in the gut so that you have to view the work differently. I'm not one that can do something the same way for a long time. That would drive me crazy. I'm always looking for adventure and growth. I want to grow as an artist. Just as he looks with uh, an equally critical and reverent eye to various aspects of our society, he also does that with art history and inspire us to reassess it, inspire us to reassess the role of black people in today's society and he wants us to wonder. I think that's all I'm doing is posing more questions than answers. I'm trying to convey things that are important to me and hoping that there's a common denominator of other people feeling the same things. When you conceptualize something, it's so personal, you know, and then once it gets out there, everybody else is bringing their own baggage to the work, but there has to be some common denominators of that, and I think that's what I'm trying to be the voice for the underdog. In the Endangered series, you see that posed as a question to us. So you see these very beautiful, very naturalistic portraits of young black men. And what they inspire us to think about is what point in these young men's lives are we looking at? We don't know, but we have to ask ourselves, what's the future of these young men in any case? I think there's some humor in the Universal Bunnies. I think there's humor in some of the Delta pieces because basically I'm conveying that lifestyle which is pretty light when you really get into it, listening to the music, being transported, hearing those stories from those old guys, you know, smoking little brown cigarettes with them. They have stories and a lot of those stories are humorous and a lot of the stuff there's inside jokes for black people that maybe other people might not even understand but it's just something that culturally has been embedded in, in us for a long time and I bring out little things that are funny to us. This is a 40 plus year retrospective and one of the things that brought me to, to Floyd's work and, and kept me coming back to it was that he 
as an artist is able to create this beautiful balance between the most elegant representations and the most challenging ones. You're drawn into the work via this absolute beauty and elegance. And then as you spend more time with it, as you get up close and look at all of the physical layers to it, you'll find things that challenge your expectations of what art should be, of what art should do. And to me, that's when art is at its best. First of all, it has to draw someone in. You have to have some visual dialogue. You have to have some interest in the piece. And once you get drawn in, then I use different devices. Sometimes I make it very comfortable for you to come to the piece. And then once you get there, then I throw little things in there that's not so comfortable, but get you to think differently or to emote differently about that particular work. I think art should change how we think about things. That's what art should do. To see more of Floyd Tunson's work, visit TunsonArt.com. Jeff Ladau jumped into five and a half feet of water on the first day of summer at age 18 and broke his neck, leaving him a quadriplegic. But Ladau doesn't let that fateful day define his life. He's continuing to live and pursue his passions, one of which is painting. Here's his inspiring story. Each painting is an achievement and like, you know, setting your goals. I kind of set them high and I've achieved every goal so far that I sought out to conquer. The goal of becoming a painter was far from the mind of an 18-year-old Jeff Ladau, the cool water beckoning on a warm, sunny day. It was the first day of summer and um, we were going to go scuba diving. And when we were waiting for the equipment, uh, we went across the street and swam in the pool a bit. And I took a, too deep of a dive into five and a half feet of water and hit the bottom and shattered my neck. Not shattered it, but bruised it mostly. So that left me a quadriplegic, unable to use my hands or my feet. So I was paralyzed. I got a remote control TV and I started to use it to change my channels. I thought, you know, I'm going to start painting with this too. And I made a mouthpiece by everything you know, I've seen. And um, I began just to take small classes. Then I took MATC classes for a while. And then Elena Elke at the Milwaukee Art Museum took me on in her class studying the old masters and painting inside the museum. The process of creating a painting takes a lot of planning. Ladau starts with a series of dots, a technique he developed to get the horizon in the right spot and to set the vanishing points on the canvas. Then he expands to short strokes using a very thin brush. I'll get uh, bits and pieces of what I want to do and sometimes looking art books and see how things are, you know, composed and um, I'll start with a premature it's an undercoat and then with the dots I can do a painting and line it up with the dots to the vanishing point and if something's crooked, at least a dot that can erase real easy where if I do a one line it's crooked, you know, it's a lot easier to do one little dot than it is to change that whole line. So it's a lot easier. Some of my stuff is real detailed because I am working with such a small brush and smaller canvases help. The larger paintings offer a very different challenge to a mouth painter. Ladau found a way to work around it. I'm painting like that, I have to paint sideways, upside down, 
because my brush will only reach like 12 inches, so you have to be creative and, you know, think of what it's going to look like upside down and sideways. I can pull the easel closer or further, and I mix my colors right up on my lap with the table I have, so I don't find no disability about it. I just find it as a working career. A career helped in good part by an organization called Mouth and Foot Paint Artist. The main product of the company is cards with motifs painted by the member artist. The MFPA represents 800 mouth and foot painting artists in 70 countries all around the world. The artists receive grants or are taken on as members and receive a regular income for their artistic proficiency. They solely make their money by their sales of the cards and calendars. They don't really like to get charity. It's not considered a charity group. We're work, we work for our money and we earn it, so it makes you feel a lot more gratifying in life. To learn more, visit MFPAUSA.com. Visiting an art museum can sometimes be intimidating. Not knowing Rembrandt from Picasso can leave some feeling embarrassed, lost, or perplexed. Now the Cleveland Museum of Art is offering some good news. There's an app for that. Recently, the museum began offering visitors iPads loaded with software called ArtLens, which works with a set of large video screens called a collection wall to put information about the artwork right at your fingertips. One of the things that museums do with works of art when they hang them on the wall or they put them on a pedestal, sometimes they're taken out of their original context. And what the ArtLens iPad app can do is restore some of that context. And so you can use the iPad to scan works of art and the iPad in camera mode will recognize those works and hotspots will pop up immediately and you'll find out some chunks of information. If you want to delve more deeply, there are two other ways in which you can do that. You can take an organized tour on the iPad app and you can uh, take a tour of Gallery 1 or you can go into the main collection galleries and take a tour that will allow you to go through and find works of art that you like. Um, there's another section that is uh, more for browsers and that's called Near You Now and it uses the GPS system in the iPad uh, to navigate you through the galleries and um, you can find works of art that you like and see if they are interpreted in uh, the iPad app and you can connect with video, with audio, uh, many voices from the museum and also from the community uh, can round out your experience of these works of art in amazing ways. The iPad can be docked at our collection wall, which is a wonderful cutting edge, one of a kind 40 foot multi-touch screen that shows uh, all of the works in our collection that are on view, plus some others. You can dock the iPad at the collection wall. You can begin to interact with the wall and browse through and find works of art that you really like. Uh, you can save them to the iPad and then uh, begin to create a list of favorites or even create your own tour. And then you can go into the galleries based on your interests. What we're trying to do with this technology is put the visitor front and center to allow them to create their own pathways through our collection to have a really meaningful experience. We don't want to dictate to them what they can do. Uh, they can come here and create their own experience uh, and uh, really enjoy themselves here. So in this view, you can see all of the works in our collection that are on view in our permanent galleries right now, plus some works that are not on view. And uh, we love this wall because it gives you a sense that the collection is always in motion. It is always changing right before your eyes, depending on how you look at it, depending upon the perspective that you have. 
uh, and you can see it as a living organism rather than something that's stagnant and remote. So if you go up to the wall, you can select a work of art, you can find out that it actually is related to a number of other works in our collection uh, according to categories. So here, uh, this wonderful portrait of Nathaniel Hurd is an American painting. And if you go through this cover flow, you can find other American paintings in our collection uh, and begin to see, uh, sort of set that wonderful portrait in context. But you can also find out uh, here is an American painting from the 1940s. Well, let me select the 1940s and see other works of art from the 1940s in our collection. This takes you across uh, uh, geography to see what were artists doing across the world in 1940. So it's a wonderful tool. If you come to a work of art, let's say this work, and you really love it, you can use your iPad And you can dock it here at the collection wall. And you can save the artwork to your iPad. It's almost like a self-guided tour. You know, instead of having to wait for a particular tour to start, you can pick your favorite pieces of artwork and learn as much as you want to at your own pace, which is really nice. Because I wanted to get closer to the artwork, you can always read the little tag cards next to the work, and it just gives you a little bit, but here I just found out with this piece, I can actually see some video of how this piece was actually created, which gives me another layer of learning about the artwork. It does free you up. It makes you feel a little more um, to be connected with the work, but also feel the space of what uh, information they're trying to give to you. There's a lot of information, but it's so freeing that it, it, it's not piled on you all at once, and so you can memorize a lot more of the information as well and take it home with you. Uh, many times people feel like works of art are inaccessible, that they're in a case, that somehow they're even dead. And we need tools to help people feel like these works are actually alive and that visitors uh, in their exchange with works of art have something to say to actually change the life of a work of art, to make it uh, relevant in their lives. So a technology can be a great tool in bridging that gap between antiquity and 2013. Uh, but we found that visitors said, sort of in the aggregate, two things. They wanted a personal presence in the gallery. They really wanted somebody they could come up to and talk to, ask questions of. But they also wanted uh, a technology piece, something that would allow them, sort of on their own time, to be able to fill in the gaps and understand works of art more so that either they might feel less intimidated by the works of art on view, or if they're a seasoned visitor, uh, it just allows them to find more and more information. Yes, it's amazing. Like, the sculpture around the corner is from, like, year one. I mean, it's like 2,000 years old, but it just shows the power of art and that there's different ways of enjoying it. So our peers in the field say all eyes are on Cleveland because we're using technology in a new way. Uh, we are creating this wonderful collection wall that you see behind us using uh, a very large 40-foot microtile screen. This is the largest that we know of. But we're using technology in interesting combinations so that you can dock your iPad at the collection wall, use them in tandem uh, as a, a big tool that then can sort of vault you into the permanent collection uh, with a lot of information under your belt and a lot of fun. The Art Lens app is the first of its kind in the country. You can download Art Lens to your own iPad from clevelandart.org. In the wake of the 2010 devastating earthquake in Haiti, a prominent Port-au-Prince dance company, like so many others, faced tragedy when their studio was destroyed and many of the dancers and students were forced to flee. With the help of some prominent Miami community leaders, the stunning ensemble has since received glowing international attention. The dance troupe's endurance is a testament to triumph in the face of adversity and a tribute to the enduring spirit of the Haitian culture. You're going to get an idea of Haiti. I mean, the real Haiti, the one that you don't see 
in TV, the one that's behind. Aiko Dance is Haiti in Creole. A-Y-I-T-I -I in Creole, that's the name, that's how we say Haiti. Contre Dance is a kind of dance that we have in our tradition, in our traditional dance. It's like a vals. It dances one, two, three, one, two, three. I saw that Contre Dance is a kind of dance related really to what I'm doing. It's not 100% Asian, it's not 100% European or Occidental, but this is the kind, that's why I've decided to put Haiti Contre Dance, it gives you Aiko Dance. The live drum is it's crude, it's real, it's there's nothing at that moment for that specific timing of dancing is gonna be different. There's different stories, there's different vibes going on between the drummers and the dancers. So it'll always be different and that's what I like about it. My dancers or myself, I say that we are here today. We don't know where we will be tomorrow. So every time these dancers, they step on stage, it's like they are struggling and they are trying to tell their real story. Their physicality is extraordinary. Uh, their way of dancing together uh, on this stage is extraordinary. And they dance as if they're never going to dance again. Whether you are a doctor or a president of an art center, a bricklayer, a carpenter, whatever you're doing, if you see, hear, and feel this expression of dance, I guarantee you, you will be highly uplifted and ready for your next day of work. That, that's what happens to the energy level inside your own body. I like light, because when you're thinking about the piece, you see the movement, you know, how you move in space, and the color. This is part of Haiti's story, the tents and the blue, this color, but the beauty of it. It's, it's something very artistic. We didn't want to bring on stage the misery. Every time they think about Haiti, they will think that we are crying. Uh, we cry inside, we feel it, we create with, through this struggle, but uh, we don't need pity. We need to, to, to share the beauty of what we have uh, with people. The demand for Aiko dance was created because Haitians are here and uh, along with other diverse communities that are here. Our relationship with the Art Center is something very special. It's more than being in a theater. It's a partnership, it's friendship, and hopefully we'll be together for, for years. It's, it's a perfect, perfect together kind of match. In terms of art, in terms of what the artist over there wants to say, I think you should come and see this other angle of Haiti and what we have to say about our country, about our culture, about our colors and our joys, our pain, everything. I hope I do leave people with a certain message that I have in my heart. If you want to cry, if you want to laugh, if you feel like you're, you're, you're mad, if you're, then I did my job, then I'm glad with that. The culture of Haitian movement and dance and expression is so positive and so upbeat. And that's a part of Haiti we think we can help create the platform for the rest of the world to see. To learn more, visit the Dance Troops website. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find featured videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you.